Hi guys, I want to talk about three million years of art history. So in a way, our entire semester journey through this, this art history tool is three million years of art history. But what I want to do just to get started is to talk about the, the beginning and the end, the bookends, the alpha and the omega of this journey. So here in ancient, you'll notice we have Greece and Rome, and then we go back down to history. And then we have this word at the bottom of it all before. And then over here in modern, we have 19th century, 20, 21, and then up at the top, we have beyond. So before I say before and beyond, we'll note that before is at the bottom and beyond is the top. So let me say a little note about the way this chart works. Um, here in the West, we read from left to right and from top to bottom. This chart also reads from left to right. However, it does not read from top to bottom. It reads from bottom to top. Why? Okay, let's jump into prehistory for a sec here. Um, so, well, let me, let me go even one backed up more than that. So we have the Middle Ages, for example, and you may know that the Middle Ages were formerly called the Dark Ages because we sort of thought, eh, nothing much happened, thousand years, whatever, Dark Ages. And so, you know, then later somebody said, well, okay, Dark Ages, that's a pretty chauvinistic view. So we came up with the sort of less judgmental Middle Ages. And then as we start to look, we find out that, well, a lot of different things were happening. It wasn't one monolithic thing, it was many things. So anything that you look at, history or probably anything else, the more carefully you look and you start to study, you find divisions. So for example, when we come here to prehistory, um, so right, we talk about the Bronze Age and these different ages, and we just used to talk about the Stone Age, the Lithic Age, the Lithic Age, the Stone Age. And then as we looked, we said, oh, well, it wasn't one thing, so we have to split that up. So we have, for example, the Neolithic Age, the New Stone Age, and the Paleolithic Age, the Old Stone Age. And this process just keeps going. So as we look at the Paleolithic, we find, well, that wasn't just one thing either. There's, there's pieces of that. So we have the Upper Paleolithic 40,000 to 12,000. So I put KYA for thousand years ago or MYA for million years ago. So the lower goes all the way back to two million years ago. So again, on this vertical thing, let me show you some strata from somewhere, some archaeological site. So you'll notice that it's, it's got a where it is location, but it's also got a depth, a meter, two meters, three meters, four meters. And we see at the top this modern limestone rubble and then uh, Magdalenian and Aurignacian and then down to Middle Paleolithic. So what it's doing is mapping time in this vertical strata of the Earth. And so if you think um, of, let's just say that we were going to be McDonald's parking lot archaeologists and we showed up with our shovel. So what happens in my little pretend McDonald's parking lot? Well, people get Happy Meals and they don't like the toys or they just break or they just forget them or whatever and they throw them out the car window and other people come and run over them with their cars or walk over them or McDonald's repaves the parking lot. So if you start digging in this McDonald's parking lot of art history, um, the first thing you're going to come to is last year's Happy Meal toys. Dig deeper, and what, what did those get thrown on top of? They got thrown on top of the Happy Meal toys from the year before. So if you keep digging, you're going to come up to Happy Meal toys from 10 years ago. Happy Meal toys from when you were born, before you were born. And the earth is the same way. Now, not all parts of the earth were inhabited at all times, so there are plenty of places where you might not find anything, or you might find something at one layer and then not at another. But where the earth is inhabited, digging deeper is time traveling. It's going down in the earth. So that's the way archaeology digs tend to work, and that's the reason this chart has uh, reads from bottom to top, that the earliest is down here, and then we go up through time. And so when we slice up Paleolithic, in fact, it's literally upper Paleolithic, meaning the first part you hit with a shovel, not earlier than Neolithic, which would be even higher, but the first part of the Paleolithic, and lower Paleolithic means the bottom part of the dig. Okay, so that's how we label, and that's why old is at the bottom and new is at the top, just like the earth. Okay, so to these two words, before and beyond. Um, so what I have here is a piece of red jasperite, a water-worn pebble. It's like maybe two and a half inches tall or so. And here I have a plaque from a Pioneer spacecraft. 
Um, so the human race is about 40,000 years old. We've been on this planet about that long. This pebble is 3 million years old. So this predates us by a lot. So what is art? Well, there are a lot of definitions, as you can imagine, and art is different things to different people. But one of the definitions that people might use would be that it's something that is worked by a human hand. Um, so although this may look like a face to you, and you might imagine somebody taking a stick and sort of rotating it to carve out these eyes, in fact, that's not how this piece was made. This is a water-worn pebble. It was in a stream or under a ledge, and water over who knows how many years created this. So if art is something that's worked by a human hand, this pebble is neither human, it's Australopithecan, and it wasn't worked uh, by anything other than water. And if you think about, let's say, a rainbow, for many people, a rainbow is extremely beautiful, but a rainbow, we wouldn't call it art, right? If you made a painting of a rainbow, maybe that painting isn't even as good as the rainbow experience itself, but we would call the painting art because a human took the time to create and express whatever that was. Okay, so I know a sculptor here in Los Angeles, a very successful sculptor actually, um, who was driving in the Mojave Desert one day. He looked off to his right and saw something and wound up taking his truck off the road. And what he found was this old barrel, that circular inner part of a washing machine, which people had been shooting at for who knows how long. There was, the paint was all chipped off pretty much. And there was just this kind of rusted metal, you know, copper brown uh, and a lot of holes. He thought it was amazing. He threw it in the back of his truck. He drove home to Los Angeles where, amazingly enough, he was having a show a week later. So he put a pedestal in the middle of the art gallery. He put this washing machine barrel on it. He titled it Shot Full of Holes. Um, a rather famous Hollywood producer uh, walked in, liked it, wrote him a check for $10,000. And when the show closed, uh, the artist drove to the producer's actually tennis court and delivered this barrel. So... Technically, by the definition I've just offered, this wasn't art. Um, you know, it wasn't, I mean, I guess you could say people shot at it to make it, but basically the sculptor didn't do anything other than find it, other than use his eye, his aesthetic sensibility to realize this piece. Um, but it has sort of the, the validation of a gallery willing to show it and somebody who has power and money willing to acquire it. Um, so if, if the washing machine barrel is art of some sort, then maybe this is too. Um, and what do they look like? Did, were Australopithecans on all fours? And does that matter? Does that somehow make them less if they walk upright? Does that, is, is that a conceit of ours that that means something special? Well, here's maybe what they look like. Um, and by this rendering, you know, they don't look exactly like us, obviously, but we see kind of a family unit and we see a lot of familiar qualities and, you know, in between sort of hunting and surviving, maybe they would see something in this stone. So here's what's really interesting about this stone is that it was found in a cave in South Africa 20 miles from the nearest source of red jasperite. So the only explanation that I'm aware of for how that could come to be is that someone saw this thing and like my sculptor friend, recognized something in it, had an aesthetic experience with it, saw perhaps something of themselves in it or something of their kind in it, and found this little stone compelling enough uh, that they were willing to carry it as they walked barefoot you know, for 20 miles and ultimately leave it to rest in this cave. So you know, I think that level of recognition and experience um, is kind of powerful. And so for many people, this wouldn't technically be called art, but for me, I'm going to say it's a rather compelling piece of art. Okay, that's my before moment. Let's go over here to after. Um, so this thing. So as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the inhabitants of planet Earth have hurled a lot of stuff into space. We've launched a bunch of space shuttles. We've sent, you know, we've walked on the moon. We've sent a lot of other things to the moon. We've been driving robots all over Mars, we've flown by Jupiter, we've orbited the sun, we've thrown a lot of stuff into space. Amazingly enough, however, um, we have only, in the entire history of the human race, the United States, any other country, we have only ever hurled four things, besides radio waves, four objects beyond the solar system. Uh, everything else is 
orbiting or crashing or somehow not leaving the solar system. But um, these four objects, twin Voyager spacecraft and twin Pioneer spacecraft, are indeed headed for true interstellar space. Voyager 1 today is at the heliopause, this very, very distant place, far, far, far beyond the outermost planets, where the very last particle of the solar wind gives way to true interstellar space. So if the human race were to disappear because of self-annihilation or our sun eventually one day going nova, um, so far, the, all that would be left to say that we had ever existed, all of our culture, all of our creations, all of our anything, um, would be, again, besides radio waves, would be these four objects. Um, the fancy Voyager spacecraft have records that you can play and get a lot of info, but the earlier twin pioneers had only this plaque, um, which has the phase of a hydrogen atom, and you can't really make it out, but these are vertical and horizontal hash marks. Um, which show very prominent stars in the local region and the distances from them to our sun. And then this is the sun and these are the planets and this is a little diagram. So from the third planet comes this little thing you're now looking at, this pioneer, which this is a diagram of the pioneer. And here's a man and a woman in front of it. So my message about this ton of art contained in all these links that we're going to be looking at in the days to come is a pretty simple message, really, that, that these are two bookends, that this three million year old object from before us, not even from us, and this object that was indeed made by us, but will, uh, you know, undoubtedly live a, outlive us all, um, that everything we have ever created or do or thought or felt exists between these two objects, that every wild, improbable dream Every deepest secret fear, all the love, all the hate, all the war, all the peace, you know, all the horrific atrocities, all the beautiful poetry, that the entire human experience is bookended by these two objects. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of funny to think of something so vast and essentially just limitless in the number of people and the, the things we've created and felt. Um, and yet, at least in one sort of graphic sense, it's all going to fit within. So that's the launch of three million years of art history, and we will dive into many places along the way um, in the weeks to come. Thanks.